again, and welcome to another episode of Uncut. I'm here today with my friend Roberto Luca, who I met a couple of years ago. He was recently released from, from prison, and we met at a conference related to community colleges, and he was a student, a college student while incarcerated, and, and a student on the outside as well. And I've been really impressed with the work he's been doing over the past couple of years, and and uh, we have bumped into each other in the community a couple different times. And so he, we are joined today by a couple of great men. Um, we have Erasmo Reyes and Joel, Joel Aguilar here with us. And, and I don't know much about them. I'm gonna learn about their situation, their lives and what they're doing along with you. So for the group, and I'll kind of let you lead this Roberto I'd like to know for the, the men and women that are inside that are still incarcerated, uh, I'd like to, to really focus on the question through your personal stories. And the question is, what can people do to best prepare starting right now, you know, wherever they are and regardless of where they are in, in their journey, what can people do right now to prepare for the realities of of reentry, but maybe more specifically, even the workforce and and even entrepreneurship. And let's just go from there. Roberto? Awesome. Uh, thank you, Brandon. I'm happy to be here with, with Raz and, and Joel. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, thinking back though, to the time where I was in that transformational stage for me inside it a little even further back from that question. Um, one of the things that, that I have been able to look back over, over my journey um, while I was inside is to, to understand that during the course of time, I always had these like inklings and these, these emotions and these thoughts that were telling me something but I never really uh, listened to. Um, so, you know, being in prison, going through everything that I that I went through, um, there were times where, you know, I asked myself, was I doing the right thing? Um, is this the life that I want to live for the rest of my life? Am I willing to make um, these sacrifices or continue to to um, live under this, this spell or this philosophy of mine for the rest of my life. So uh, Roberto, you, you did 28 years, is that correct? Uh, 28 uh, years, uh, uh, yes. Spent, spent your, your fair share amount of time in uh, ad seg and, and- Solitary con solitary confinement. confinement. And so based on that baseline of where you started your prison experience and, and where you came from and uh, perhaps reasons for being in prison, uh, weren't you the guy that was always getting into trouble? <laughs> yeah, I was. I was. I definitely was that, that guy um, that was very um, committed to what I was doing at that time. Um, and, you know, that led me to living the type of, of life that I continue to, to find myself in situations uh, where I was digging a deeper hole for myself, you know, and also um, disconnecting further and further away from, from my family and, like, who I really was. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 I was, you know, that, that person. Um, coming forward and kind of getting back to your question is that I think one of the things that helped me the most um, was just a sense of preparedness. You know, I didn't know what career I was going to have. I didn't know where I was going to live. I, I didn't know um, who was going to support me and who wasn't when I stepped out of prison. And I was afraid. You know, I wouldn't admit it but I was very afraid. Um, so coming out of prison after all those, all those years, um, having some family support, it was very, very important for me to find a network. However, 
while I was inside, you know, I started to develop a sense of self-worth. And the way I did that was through accomplishing the goals that I set out for myself. If I wanted to graduate uh, from a class, if I wanted to get my GED. Um, so all those things really, the, the self-help programs, I was the last person in the world that I, I, would, that I thought I would believe in a self-help program. Um, but it helped me change. How many years did it take you to come to that realization? So you spent a fair amount of time uh, getting yourself, digging a deeper hole, as you put it, for yourself. It took, it took 22 years and a, and a second life sentence that I, that I earned while I was inside um, to, for the continuum of my destructive behavior. Um, so it was, it was a very long, long journey for me. Um, and when I removed myself from that type of thinking, you know, I didn't have any, any hatred. I didn't have any, any um, misgivings. I didn't, because I knew I had done it to myself and I had nobody to blame but myself. And really coming to terms with that and understanding that it wasn't the judge, it wasn't the system, it wasn't the homies, it was me. Um, was was really very, very transformational for me. Um, and, and, you know, those, those were like my first steps um, into transforming um, to who I am today. That's great. That's a great story. So you you came from, it sounds like you were somewhat of a leader inside uh, the, the prison system to lead people to do uh, things that were against the prison rules. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then you, you had this change of maybe, it sounds like your change was more of a mindset yeah, it was, it, was, your head. it was it was my mind, but it was also a spiritual awakening for me, you know, yeah. and tra transformation is very personal and there's one no story that is alike. So um, what are you doing now? I mean, you've been out for what, a couple of years and what, uh, what are you doing now? So, um, in the past three years, as soon as I, I uh, came home. I was fortunate enough to, to, because of the education that I got, I was uh, inside a prison and preparing myself inside before I came home. Um, I was I was very prepared. Um, I took classes in public speaking. I took you know college credits and, and things like that. Um, but I I became a a case manager out here um, almost the first year that I was out. Um, after trying different jobs in construction and, and working in warehouses and, and other things like that, just taking any job that I could at the time, trying to figure out what direction I was going in my life. And I always had this calling um, to wanting to continue to help and, and kind of, I, I'm a fighter, I'm a warrior, you know, and, and this space gives me an opportunity to be a warrior for my community, for my people, for my family. Um, and support my brothers and sisters that are coming home. Um, and then also finding a great network is, is pivotal to transformation. And, you know, um, I was fortunate enough to, to connect back with uh, Joel and Raz, um, who are, you know, I know I'm going to share uh, their stories, um, but they've been uh, pivotal to my change because when I first met Raz, you know, he's a businessman. And he had been out um, already for many years. And the last time I seen him was in juvenile hall when we were 16 years old, facing murder charges. And the same thing with Joel, uh, with Joel. Um, I, I seen him and he just looked like a totally different person. Like his presence, it, it, there was like this light coming from him. He was just like a, a good person. Um, and coming home and seeing individuals like them and others, uh, mentors and, and, you know, people that I've been fortunate enough to meet out here gave me the understanding that, wait a minute, there's a place for me out here. There's a way to do this. And um, when I talked to you a couple weeks ago about the possibility of doing this show, you said, I'd love to do it, but 
but I, I can't do it without my buddies, Raz and Joel, and they have a story to tell. And, and so why don't you uh, introduce us to, to Raz and Joel? Sure. Um, so as I said before, the last time that I had seen these guys, we were 16 years old. Um, you know, hence 29 years later, we connect again. Um, you know, I never thought that Joel was going to get out. You know, he was, he was facing life without the possibility of parole. You know, the person that, that Raz was um, when we were young, you know, I, I, I never imagined him being anyone different. Um, and here I come home and, you know, I, I meet him at a house that he just remodeled, you know, and, you know, I'm like looking at this guy and he's sitting at the table with a, with a realtor and an attorney, you know, and me and, and uh, Joel come walking in and, you know, he, he's smiling and I'm like, damn, that's the same Raz, you know, that's that same smile. Um, but it was, it was very um, hopeful for me to connect with someone like them um, because it gave me the understanding that I too can accomplish great things. Um, so I, I'll let Raz, you know, tell a little bit about his story and, and what he's doing today, um, you know, out here in the community. And, and, and really, when you talk about transforming LA, reimagining Los Angeles, you know, he's a building and design owner of LA Reset. So, you know, there you go, Raz. Take it away, buddy. Good morning, and uh, thank you uh, both for allowing me to partake in this uh, beautiful moment. Um, you know, I, I, I've been out uh, since 2003, and my life has has just been on the go, 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 go. Uh, I got married very quickly uh, when I came home. And uh, I have seven children. Uh, I'm a big proponent for uh, the family unit. And, and I'm a firm believer that you cannot change anything unless you're not making uh, contributions within your home and, and, and the people that you live with, the people that see you on a day to day and know who you really are. Uh, in its totality, uh, I'm very blessed to to be married and, and have seven children. Um, they're all at different ages and stages of their life, but I would say that that's been the driving force for myself. That's been the fuel, even you know, as a young man, uh, being a, a gang member, being a product of of the late eighties and very early nineties gang epidemic in Los Angeles. And, you know, uh, at the age of 16 meeting, uh, Robert and Joel in, uh, central juvenile hall, East Lake K and L, uh, for those of you that have been incarcerated for any number of years, you know, that that was the segue for, uh, children getting tried as an adult, you know, uh, and that's what we were, you know, we were children. And I see that now as I see my own children. Um, gosh, things, things were, you know, much different. Uh, I left my home at the age of 15, almost 16 years old. Ironically, uh, I always had a job. I always had a job. Uh, I was always a kid that like grew up on the other side of the tracks, but was always around like very affluent people and I always had a glimpse of what the other side looks like. Uh, I guess the only thing is, is that I always had to come home to my environment and <clears throat> what was going on at the time. And uh, the truth is, is that I had no supervision uh, and I was left to myself. I was left to, to make uh, destructive 
choices for myself because there was nobody really policing my behavior. There was nobody like influencing me to do the right thing. And it wasn't that my parents were bad people because they weren't. They were, they are actually pretty amazing people. They, they just, uh, they didn't know any better. They worked two jobs and, and their absence dictated a lot of uh, what I was doing, you know, at that age. And uh, I, I later on, uh, you know, went to prison and, and uh, I remember uh, by default, by default, I was always, you know, around like very, very affluent people uh, within, you know, the criminal enterprises and, and prison gangs within uh, the prison, uh, California Department of Corrections. Uh, I was uh, in Corcoran in the very early 90s at the age of uh, 18 and 19 years old. I was already in the Corcoran shoe program. And again, anybody that knows what was going on at that time in, in within the confines of uh, the shoe program, it, it was pretty wild, you know, and, and those were like defining moments in my life. But, you know, there was always a part of me that wasn't fully committed to that lifestyle because I knew obviously right from wrong. And I knew that there was another life and I was never a lifer, you know, so there was always something that held me back from being fully sold out to the lie that I was living, uh, even though, you know, things were happening and, and within the Hispanic community, uh, being from Los Angeles, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're almost mandated to, to partake in what's going on, you know, within this time period, this time frame, and, and these institutions that, that I was in, uh, I, I later went to Pelican Bay uh, to the shoe program there and, and, and I was released uh, to uh, a facility. A facility at the time was deemed a, a, a yard that was in transition to being converted from a no good yard to a good yard, but uh, the, good, the, the good as it were at the time uh, was was heavily immersed and you know there was a lot of things happening and 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 uh i was able to parole from a facility you know in this transition and uh man it, it was it was really wild you know uh paroling from there and and then coming home and and being involved in everything that was going on at uh, on the streets and and uh, again, I, I just always had a job. I always knew what it was to work. I always knew, I always had like a strong family based environment as well. There was always this idea of, of I always knew right from wrong. And that always uh, bothered me personally within myself. Uh, you know, I was, I, I, I guess having the ability to to be in power uh, in, in in within my neighborhood and within institutions, I never I never wielded it. I never thought much of it. I always tried in my ignorance to use it for the greater good of the community that I was in, and you know I, I was very much deceived. You know I I could see it now. I was very much deceived and. You know, but uh, as I transitioned, you know, and, and I, I remember uh, coming across this book in in a level two prison years, years later, when I came back to prison, I had parole from Pelican Bay twice before and, you know, gone through that whole gamut. I was still very much in the game. You know, I, I was a lot smarter, so, so I thought, and... I became not so much a gang member, but a criminal for personal gain. And when uh, I begin to transition and, and, and want to change my life, 
I remember coming across this book in the chow hall. I worked in the chow hall and there was a book laying there and it said who you are when no one is looking. And man, that hit me so hard at the, in, in that moment, like that book, that title, I never even read the book, but the title hit me hard. And, you know, I, as I began to, to just read and, and, and personally develop myself, I knew that that's what integrity means, who you are when no one is looking. And I began to, to, to assess who I really was. I had a, a, another pivotal moment uh, when I was transpacking. I was transpacking from a, I had already transpacked, I'm sorry, from a three yard and they were moving me because I had dropped so many points to a, 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 a secure level one, they called it. And I thought that was pretty ironic, a secure level one. Uh, the warden told me it was just basically a level one with a, a, a fence around it. And I landed up going to CCI one, it's like a big park. And uh, I remember when I was leaving, we had just got off of a state of emergency lockdown where uh, the African-American population had uh, brutally stabbed some C correctional officers on the four facility and uh, had nothing to do with us, but we obviously uh, suffered in that, on that lockdown. Um, but that, that close custody building was, was coming, coming out and I was waiting to go to r, r to transfer. And I saw all the camaradas coming out of the close custody building and, you know, they embraced me. They were like, man, what's up? Where are you going? And, you know, I, I told them, hey, you know what? I'm leaving. I transpect during the lockdown. And, you know, the, they, there was just so much joy in in them, on their countenance, with, within their heart. And, you know, they said their goodbyes. They, they're walking to the chow hall. I hear that's a thing of the past now. Nobody walks to chow anymore. Uh, but nonetheless, when when they left and I was left to myself, I had a moment and I, I began like to, to just cry helplessly. And in that moment, all I could think is like, like, wow, this is the highlight of their life. All these guys are lifers. They're never coming home. They're very much in the game. Uh, and this is it. This is the highlight for them. But I'm not a lifer. Like I like I gotta like get myself together and and figure out what I'm gonna do with myself because this can't be my life. You know, I remember a, a, a lifer a friend of mine told me one day that there's nothing worse than an old fool. He's all, uh, you know what, when you're young, he told me in Spanish, he said, cuando estás morro y no sabes, se vale. When you're young and, and like you, you, you really don't know any better, like it's okay. We know that it's not, but that's what he told me. And, and I embraced that like, man, like I can't be an old fool. Like I can't continue living my life like this. And uh, that's when. I began to to reassess who I was and who I wanted to be and and what I wanted to do and I knew that my life wasn't in prison. However, I still had a lot of bad habits. I still, you know, thought that I could circumvent the system. I still thought that I could manipulate the CDC while I was incarcerated, and I. I I had to deal with all these bad behaviors that I had adopted to basically survive uh, in, in a very ugly society, a very gruesome society where I just seen a lot of violence. And, you know, I, I, I just, I just didn't know any better. And I don't want to use that as an excuse, but 
that's those were my facts. That was my reality. And uh, so I, now I'm in CCI and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in an environment that I've never been in. I don't like it. I really don't want to be there, but, uh, you know, I'm there and I got to make the most of it. So I just kind of kept to myself and, and still, you know, found a way to exploit every opportunity that I could. You know, I'm not proud of any of this, but, you know, I saw all the deficiencies in the CDC and I exploited them. You know, I, I saw the deficiencies in, in the population that I was surrounded by and I exploited them. Uh, again, not that I'm proud of this because I'm not. Uh, I quickly figured out a way on, on, on how I could smuggle in heroin, uh, you know, because there was an outside crew that went out there and, you know, it, it was just like a very loose program. It was very easy for me to uh, do that. I never, never once held heroin in my possession. You know, I, I, I don't like it, but I knew it was a means to an end for me to, you know, uh, create revenue and uh, do mail outs to my girlfriend at the time. And, you know, help her out there. But again, you know, there's, there's, uh, I guess what I would say to that is that we're very industrious individuals. We're, we're growing up in the streets. We will find a way to do something. And when we come to a point in our life where we can channel that energy and, 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 and those behaviors into something positive, it becomes such a beautiful thing because you're much more versatile than the next individual that's out here and you know i've i've as as an adult being out here in the free world i've used those unfortunate chain of events and these un unfortunate circumstances and you know what i've just worked very hard to exploit you know any opportunity that some if someone gives me an opportunity to do a job i'm taking it I'm going to run with it. Even if I don't know a hundred percent what I'm doing, I'll make it my business to, to know I'll make it my business to learn, especially now in this uh, technological age where, I mean, you can watch YouTube. There, I mean, if you want to change and you want to better yourself, there's never been a moment as now there's the most millionaires in the history is now. I mean, you can learn pretty much anything that you want to learn right now. And I would definitely say that uh, for the, the, the prison population that is listening, uh, I would say, don't kid yourself. You need to start now. You need to start unlearning these bad behaviors now. And something that you guys need to really grasp is Nobody gives a, a shit about you. Nobody cares about you. That's just straight up. Like, there's so many people that want to do shit in the CDC to, to make a name for themselves that if you fall off the map, you're just someone that, that they're going to talk about in a drunken stupor and you're going to move on. If you make a choice to change and to better your life, Simply by reading, start where you're at now, get a hold of anything that you can read, improve your vocabulary, improve uh, your thought process. And as you begin to evolve as a, as a young man, you're going to make better choices on, on what you're going to choose to read on how you're going to choose uh, not to, be the homie orale and and all you know i don't know i just can't remember when was the last time that i ever ever spoke about even when i was knee deep in the game like that was something that i didn't want to i never wanted to be viewed as the dumb cholo ever you know um i don't know i've said a lot i think joel should <laughs> I'm in here, but you know, I'm, I'm passionate about 
you know, the, the changes that I've made in, in, in the past. And, you know, I, I will say that my children, you know, have always been the driving force behind that. You know, anytime I saw my children walk in through that visiting room, I, I always thought to myself, like, like, what are you doing? How can you say that you love your kids and you would subject them to this? Those were always my thoughts, even as a young man. So as you were reflecting while you're incarcerated and your, your kids came in and you asked yourself, what are you doing? How do you contrast that feeling to what you're doing now? What, tell us a little bit about what you do now in the, in the community and to support yourself. And so, um, gosh, there's still a vital part of, of me and, 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 and my energy and my drive. Uh, um, I have, I have a son that's 30 years old. He, he works with me. I'm, I'm a licensed general contractor in Los Angeles. I own a company called Reset Los Angeles, a very fitting name, you know, uh, and we, we, uh, build, we, we, we rehab distressed homes that have been dilapidated and forgotten much like our society, our community as, you know, uh, being, gang members and, 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 and criminals, you know, we've kind of, we're dilapidated and we've been forgotten and, and we need to reset. So that's what we do with these homes. And we put them back on the market for a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of money in Los Angeles. It's unbelievable where the market is at right now as we speak. Um, so that's what I do for a living. And I also work for you know, uh, pretty affluent people, uh, people in the movie industry, producers, you know, actors, pro athletes. And then, you know, I, I do work for normal people. You know, I, I, I try to help other people that are trying to improve their living conditions. Um, I'm able to employ uh, my own family members. I'm able to employ anybody that I want to, you know, uh, anybody that I know that's coming out of prison that can look me straight in the eyes and tell me I want to work, I'll put them to work. Like, hey, let's see what you got. I know that it's not for everybody. It's really hard work. And, and I get that. I know that everyone's not going to stay with me, but I want to, I want to give them that opportunity that was given to me as a young parolee you know, a man by the name of, I'll name him by name, Craig Carlson gave me an opportunity at a, at a, a place called Roadside Lumber in Agora Hills, California, off of the 101 freeway. Uh, he gave me an opportunity. I looked him in his eyes and, and I said, hey, I want to work. I'll work hard. I'll do whatever it takes. If you give me an opportunity. And he said, awesome. I have, I have a job for you. It's uh it's the night shift. You'll come in at 11. You'll work hard. You'll work hard as you've never worked this hard in your life. I promise you. And you will leave home at 5 a.m. in the morning. And, you know, I said, awesome. Let's do it. When do I start? He said, you start today at 11. Be here. And I was there. And that was like my first opportunity. You know, I was not there for more than, than six months. And, you know, uh, I moved on. I moved on to other jobs, all construction related, uh, till I started uh, managing construction, small to medium sized construction firms, which are construction in the dollar amount of seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to twenty five million dollars. You know, managing up to you know fifty, sixty, seventy five people at any uh, given time. But hey, you know what? For, for those of you politicians in prison, if you can run prison yards, if you can run uh, blocks in, in the prison yard, guess what? You can manage people on the street, you know, as, as something that's honorable 
and would put uh, food on your children's plate. You know, you have managerial skills, believe it or not. You just don't know it yet. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I'm doing now. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, that, that I get to do this. Like, you know, when I saw Robert, he told me that he wanted to work and I was like, awesome, you know, come through. And, you know, he worked with me for quite some time. You know, he was a very hard worker. And one day he came to me and he said, man, you know what? I'm thinking about going back to school. I want to do this, that, and the other. I said, man, brother, you should, you should go do that. You should follow your passion and you should go do that. You know, you're, you're not a young man. And if you can use the gifts that God has given you by all means, hone them and, and use them and, you know, he moved on to, to do what he's doing now. And uh, we're just getting started. We're just getting started. You know, uh, <laughs> there's so many people to meet. There's so many people to help. There's so much to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, uh, you got to pick and choose. There's not enough hours in the day to do my job, but I always pick and choose uh, the priorities, and then, you know, I go home and, and, and I, I spend time with my wife and, and my children, and it's it's amazing. You know, I've had the, the privilege and the opportunity to go back and speak at juvenile camps, juvenile halls. I've been back to the TDC to, to give testimony to say, hey, you know what? I, I was someone that was just like you, perhaps maybe in a worse uh, mental condition and a little more lost, there's hope for you. You can, you can overcome this and you can go on to be a productive member of society. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't and the person next to you doesn't care. So you change, you, you, you make that decision now to change now because there's not a magic on and off button that you're gonna have when you parole. Like if you're not ready to parole, then you're not gonna get very far out here. You know, the chances of you going back to prison, you know, unfortunately will will be great. Uh, I, I, I I definitely have to charm in there and um, you know, I'm gonna give give some time to, to Joe after this, but um you know, the time that I spent with, with Raz, number one, I learned what, a, what it is to earn a dollar. Like I learned the value of money. And that's something that, that I never knew, you know, because I've never worked in, in a, I never earned a paycheck. I never sweated, you know, for, for my dollar. Um, so I learned the value of a dollar uh, with rest. The other thing I learned was his attention to detail is bar none. You know, his attention to to the lines, you know, to to the cleanliness of a construction site, to to the dangers. Um, I mean, it's just and then the other part I learned was the integrity piece he talked about. He always made sure that the foundations that we built were the strongest and he never cut a corner. Because, and I asked him, and I don't even know if he remembers this, but in the work, I asked him, like, you know, why does this have to be there? And why does these extra, um, you know, uh, uh, planks or, or, or metal beams have to be there? And he goes, because that's going to hold the home, like, and, and, and it won't let it shift and it won't let it shake when there's an earthquake. And... If my family were in that home, you know, I want my home built that way. And so the work that he did to me was like, okay, like he's thinking about another person's family living in that home that he's building. And, and, and that's going to be on his conscience. You know, if he starts to cut corners, that's where the integrity piece comes in. You know, so those are just a few things that I learned with the time that I was with him. But uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to, to Joe. Take it away, Joe. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you for this time. How are you doing, Brad? Uh, I hope not to be long-winded and take too much, but I think that what men can start doing now, I know that my, my um, approach when I went into prison was a lot different than a lot of men, fortunately and unfortunately, you could say, is that I didn't take the path of most prisoners when they enter prison. I had a spiritual awakening. God got a hold of me real quick when I was in, in my first, uh, you could say, days in prison. So I started, my, I started off in prison really thinking about how I wanted to manifest myself in there. And these were my options. <clears throat> I can die in prison, you know, becoming a notorious prisoner and be known, you know, all my life as a notorious prisoner and die in here, or I can die in here, you know, being who I am, not afraid, and die in here, perhaps, the only thing that could be rescued is that, hey, this was a man who, in spite of like everything that he's been through and in spite of his life here in prison and that he's gonna die, that you can honestly say, you know what? That was a good man. And that's the only good thing that I wanted to leave with on this earth is the good man. That's how I wanted to manifest myself in prison. So I, I, my path was set clear I worked, most of my jobs have been law library, chapel. I spent most of my time reading books, devoted my life to the life of the mind. And when I got the opportunity to enter a college program, I did, and it was like the most time for me. It was a very lonely place because all I had was myself and my books and my ideas, and I wanted to manifest myself in prison as a good person and you know how hard that was that was very difficult you know i mean think about think about um us putting together a bunch of pit bulls in one room and thinking hey guys figure it out don't kill yourself pit bulls whatever you do i know it's your nature but hey try to make this work so that was kind of like what i was up against try to make this work in an environment that uh, the chances of you making it are not going to be but hey i tried and you know, um, I think that what I could say to these men is like, start planning how you want to manifest yourself when you get out. Prison and life sentences is not the same now than when it was five or 10 years ago. The hope and the message is out there. How do you want to manifest yourself? These are questions that you have to ask. How do you want to manifest yourself when you get out? You know, um, that's important. As you listen to our stories, is okay, we plan a lot of things out in life. Why not our life? You have a moment right now that you probably would not be in the best, you are in the best position right now to bargain with your future. You have this moment right now to bargain with your future. What are you gonna do? Let's plan it out. Let's think about what is it, what is it, and you know what? Having a job is important. Having a roof over our head is important. But a lot of the guys, and especially I speak to my older population, you know, maybe a career is not maybe a realistic option for them now. Maybe a lot of them are coming out in their 70s and their 80s. Maybe their health is not as well but there's still a lot for them to do out here. There's still a lot of purpose. Understanding that a lot of men are coming out to bury siblings. They're coming out to bury parents, uncles, and aunts. Life is very, very, very difficult. It's just not about a nine to five. It's about juggling all the other things in life. And maybe, your time in this life is to be there for your family and to be there in these moments that are gonna be very difficult. And as an old man now, we should look forward to teaching the younger generation. There's still a lot of work to do even within our own families. Our families are coming home to broken homes. We're coming home to families who have been broken for so many years. 
that we are the catalyst to bring a change. We're still mentors. You know, you're, you're useful. You know, there's still a lot for us to do. What happens when you're out here and you only have that one moment to say goodbye to your brother who's passing away, who's dying of cancer, and he has kids? You don't think that they're going to need a strong male figure? Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of work for us to do, and it's not just all, you know, do we need a nine to five, which is all that's important. <coughs> Other things in life that are challenges that you're going to meet that's going to take that extra for you to, like, carry through. You know, it's, it's, it's not just, you know, coming out and everything's going to be, you know, because you know, we ride this wave of hope and we expect things to just fall in place, and they're not. You know, things are not going to fall perfect. You know, some have an easier transition than others. And, you know, like, that's good that not everyone has it hard. But for those of us who don't have, you know, who don't or are not going to have it that easy out here, hey, start planning. Start thinking how you want to manifest yourself. Start thinking about, yes, you're going to need a job and you're going to need perhaps to work hard for the first year. What are you going to need to keep yourself, you know, from not getting burnt out? from not getting, you know, a uh, uh, disillusion with your work. We're not getting disillusioned with life and all its problems. You know, how are you gonna deal with technology? You know, everything now involves technology. You can't go without, you know, your GPS. Um, how do, you know, you have tools now, like they have to be aware that now when they come out, they have tools that they have to now in a sense, work at it. You have to be skillful at, 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 at using your phone. And guess what? Using your tools is gonna make life a lot easier for you. So start, like this is the beginning is to start thinking about these things. Okay, I'm gonna need a phone. How am I gonna navigate through life? I'm gonna have to learn how to use you know, a phone. Like these are all things, start putting these things on a piece of paper start planning you're going to have to first thing learn how to use a phone okay what job am i going to need like be realistic how old am i? I i'm 50 years old i'm 60 years old construction maybe i can do this for a year or two it has to be a short-term plan like you really have to give some thought into this you know when i first entered prison these were thoughts that i wouldn't even entertain because i was never coming home how I wanted to manifest myself in prison was totally different. I had that planned out. But how you want to manifest yourself in this world is a lot more different and it's going to take a lot more of uh, thought. And, you know, you can, you, can, you can take a shortcut and be like, oh, I'll worry about that when I get out. But, like, why wait and, 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 and allow and not allow yourself the time to be mentally prepared allow yourself the realistic you know um, have a realistic view of what freedom is going to look like you know and you know when we go into prison especially once you've been you've been in prison for quite some time and you learn how to program the first thing you look for when you go into a yard you look for a job you're like hey and we already know that the good jobs are behind the wall and not everyone qualifies for that. Well, guess what? Out here, you're not going to find too many of these walls where you can't go and work. Like there's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of opportunities out here. Yes, it's labor, but you have time right now to prepare yourself for, hey, you don't have to do labor. It could be a short term solution for a long term you know, career or job. The reality is, is that we cannot not think about and plan our future. We cannot not think about that we can bargain with our future right now and, and aim at something. I think that it's important for us to have an aim, for us to like think about, hey, like I got out and my desire was to, hey, how can I, for the, like this education, if I wanted to, what's, what is it gonna take for me to like go to school? And at the same time, 
have an income because I need, I need, I'm a 40 year old man. I mean, I, I, I need to survive. I need to feed myself. I need clothing. How am I going to do that? Well, I have to find a way. I have to find a balance with school and work. And I found it. Yes, the first two years were difficult. I didn't have a car. I used to wake up at four o'clock in the morning, used to get on my bike and make a 15 mile bike ride to my school. I would do it at four in the morning because by the time I got to school at, at 5.30, I wanted to make sure I had enough time to go to the restroom and wash myself up and not walk into my first class all sweaty. So that's what I would do. I would wash up, eat something, and then I'll be ready for school. And the same thing. I mean, I did that for a whole summer, but like you, you will have to like struggle at first, but I guarantee you that you would, it would get easier and easier, but to think that we don't have to plan for any, any of this or anticipate any of this, I just think that we're doing ourselves a disservice and, you know, we have to approach this. We have to approach it now as adults, I would say, as mature, you know, adults that we are, we have a lot of life experience that we can draw upon to say, hey, wait a minute, this is now what grown men do is that we have a plan. We try to find, we try to break, if we don't understand something, let's break it down to its, to its parts and try to understand the parts before we understand the whole. And believe me, it's not, it's not as challenging as some would think, but it, all it takes, I, I would say that at the end of the day, it takes you know, an effort. And, and it takes us the willingness to, hey, you know what, this is the reality of everyone now, that now, you know, you don't have to die in prison, that you can, you can, you know, one day achieve freedom and achieve a good life with, a, with hard work, yes, but it's, it's going to be so rewarding because at the end of the day, we all need to take ownership of our future and take responsibility because as, the, you know, Raz and, and Robert were saying, you know, at the end of the day, you have to make a decision for yourself, for your family, for your loved ones. What motivates you? You know, what motivates me? Freedom, hope, the fact that, you know, um, I want to manifest and do good and do my part in this world. You know, I won't speak for my friends, but, you know, when I look at my friends, you know, Robert, I'm so happy that now he's married and, you know, he's included a lot of meaning into his life. And I'm sure that now when he wakes up, he wakes up have the motivation when I look at Raz and I look at his three-year-old son that he melts my heart every time I see him I can just imagine when he wakes up in the morning and he sees that three-year-old in the pantry digging for some chocolate chip cookies that he's motivated to go to work and make a difference I think you know? I think that th thank you Joe and I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it over to you Brent but just the last thing that I'm gonna say is that if there's one thing that we have in common like the three of us just three, three different trajectories and stories is this, like, we don't quit. We didn't quit while we were inside. We didn't quit when we got out here and it's really hard, but we found a way, you know, and people see us now and they're like, man, those guys, like, that's cool, man. Like Raz just bought a new Silverado. Uh, Joel just moved into his own brand new apartment. You know, Robert's got a great job and he's doing well. But guess what? We suffered. First two years, first year, first, you know, whatever it took, we suffered. We suffered. We know how it is to be poor. We know how it is to, to, to face financial stress. We know how it is to, to not be accepted in society and, and feel stigmatized. We know all those things. But guess what? Today... The three of us, and there's a whole community out here. Don't get it twisted. It ain't just us three. There's a whole community out here of former lifers and incarcerated people that are attorneys, lawyers, contractors, managers, graduating with, with degrees. And we're just going to continue to do the work. Um, and we're going to set this place on fire because it's, it's up and moving forward. So... I just wanted to thank you for, for this opportunity and having us um, today. Well, thank you for, for this conversation. And, and most importantly, thank you for 
providing some hope for those that are still incarcerated so they can see that, that there are a lot of people that are making making a difference in this world and have turned their lives around. And, and I, I really appreciate the fact that you said that there are a whole bunch of people out there and that, that's what I see. But I wanna thank you guys for taking some time out of your day to to speak to those that are incarcerated inside of our our uh, institutions in California and hopefully you were able to provide some hope for people that are still incarcerated and I really appreciate what Joel said where in his mindset when he first came to prison was I'm gonna worry about how I project myself with the idea that I'm never coming home so he wasn't trying to to play a game, manipulate the system to see what he could do to get points knocked off his uh, sentence or you know milestone credits or whatever, it uh, it was really just about changing himself. So he led a good life while he was still incarcerated. And, and many of you are probably like that that are uh, still incarcerated and, and maybe never will come home. But but the idea of being able to change your life so you can help other people that are that are uh, incarcerated is, is a great thing to provide and have meaning in, in your life. So thank you guys for, for doing this and, and uh, hopefully we can, we can talk again sometime.